Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. I'm in Toronto and we're going to have a uh, geographically diverse uh, as well as uh, socially diverse kind of conversation today. One of my panelists is in a little town in Alaska and the other one is in Hamilton, New York, upstate New York at Colgate University. So uh, both of them are going to be talking about Siberia. And so that's where they met and that's what they have in common and what I'm interested in. I'm very interested in a project that's going on there in uh, Siberia, northern, uh, northeastern Siberia, called the Pleistocene Project, Pleistocene Park. And so uh, my first uh, panelist here is Luke Griswold Turgis, who's in Haines, Alaska. Say hi. Hello. I'm actually in San Francisco right now. Okay, I like San Francisco too. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, you, I, uh, I understand you did your uh, university work at uh, Santa Cruz, right? It's one of my favorite places in the world. It's beautiful. Oh. <laughs> I'm from Berkeley, by the way. Okay, cool. Okay, so we have a lot in common that way. And in uh, Hamilton, New York, at Colgate University, but actually in his own living room, I guess, yep. uh, is uh, uh, Michael Laurenti, who's a professor of geography at Colgate University. And he also goes to uh, Siberia to work on studying the uh, relationship between the environment and the biosphere, mm -hmm. how the environment and living creatures interact. Especially, I think you're interested in forest fires and the effect of them. Yep, that's right. Good, say hi, Mike. Hello. Okay, good. I'm so interested in this Pleistocene Park project. Um, these two fellows, uh, father and son, uh, Sergei and Nikita Zimov. I think I'd, I'd like for Luke to tell us what that's all about, if you will, Luke. Okay, well, um, Sergei and Nikita Zimov, they live in the most remote corner of Siberia. And essentially seeking no one's help and asking no one's permission, they're trying to restore the Ice Age mammoth step ecosystem on a continental scale. And they're essentially trying to just do this themselves right now. Um, and they think by doing this, they can prevent permafrost from melting. Um, and melting permafrost is going to be a huge source of carbon to the atmosphere, which will exacerbate global warming. Sergei Zimov, the father, in the late 90s and early 2000s, published a series of papers in Science Magazine that illustrated how much carbon was locked in Arctic soils and the probability it's going to melt in the near future and the impact this is going to have on global climate. It's a, it's a feedback loop. The warmer the Arctic gets, the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet. The warmer the Arctic gets, the more permafrost melts, the more carbon and methane is released into the atmosphere, in turn makes the climate warmer, in turn causes more permafrost to melt. And it's a potentially quite big feedback loop. Mike can probably explain better like the exact scope of it. Um, and they have this idea that restoring animals to the Arctic can prevent it from melting. There's a lot more to the story than that, but that's kind of it in a nutshell. And they've started doing it like just by themselves importing big animals they're all big animals that's part of the theory isn't it that it's important that they be large herbivores rabbits, rabbits aren't going to help much right no rabbits aren't going to help much so it's important that they be large herbivores so they've fenced off they've they call their project Pleistocene park they've fenced off i think 16 square kilometers uh and then they have a smaller fenced area of two square kilometers that they're mm -hmm. concentrating animals in and they have like 40 horses cold adapted yukutian horses three musk ox, all male, unfortunately, one European bison, about eight yaks, some, I don't know how many reindeer, but a certain number of reindeer, some, several moose. Uh, what else do they have? Oh, uh, several cattle, like Kalmykian cows, which are kind of related to Mongolian cows. They're also so somewhat cold adapted. There are cows that can survive in, in that kind of climate. Uh, without yeah survive by themselves you have to go out all winter long and cut a hole in the ice for them to drink water they can't survive eating snow in the winter so they can only survive with human help the Kalmykian cows 
Well, uh, okay, let's, let, that's the first thing I want to ask you uh, is, uh, you know, how much help do these animals need in general? Because <clears throat> the theory that they're going on is, well, we need to explain why, why they think that is going to pre uh, reduce the amount of permafrost melt why animals would do that but then you know i want to i want to explore the question of whether they these big animals really could uh survive on their own without uh people helping them with uh, feeding them and so on um okay i can explain there's actually three maybe four mechanisms the first one and the one that's gotten the most attention is that imagine you're a bison oh, i forgot to say they have 12 uh bison that we just brought last year. Mm. Um, so imagine you're a bison, it's the middle of winter in Siberia, and you, know, you need to eat to stay alive through the winter, mm. and you, you need grass, and grass is buried under the snow. And so snow, it's a thermal insulator, and this is a bit counterintuitive, but you know, imagine you're outside at night sleeping under the stars and you have like a thick down comforter over you. And the air is really cold, you're quite warm under that comforter, someone pulls the comforter off and you're gonna get colder. Same thing like the snow, imagine like a meter thick down comforter covering all of Siberia. The air is negative 40, the ground is like negative three, negative six, this is all centigrade. And that, that snow is a barrier between the air and the ground. It's preventing the ground from losing its heat into the atmosphere during, you know, it's like three months when the sun never comes up. Um, so you remove that snow, or if you're a bison, you're like digging through that snow, looking for grass underneath it because you're hungry. You're going to starve to death if you don't find something to eat. Um, and it reduces, it compacts or displaces the snow enough to significantly decrease the temperature of the ground. Um, this is a bit counterintuitive for people. I've seen a lot of journalists kind of mix up the mechanism, but you're basically you know, decreasing the insulative value of the snow and bringing the ground in, cold, in contact with the cold air. So that's mechanism number one. Um, mechanism number two is albedo, like the, how reflective the ground is. And I think Mike actually, did you help with their albedo measurements, Mike? Yeah, we've installed some instrumentation out there. So Good. they have, have some, a couple measurements in the parks and in areas that are grassland and areas that are forested. Um, but it's, it's a measure of reflectivity. So I think the, you know, thinking about a, a parking lot on a summer day is a, is a good example of albedo. So something that's, that's dark absorbs a lot of sunlight. And when stuff absorbs sunlight or absorbs energy, it heats up. Um, is something that, you know, something that is bright, it's bright to us because it reflects a lot of sunlight. And so it's not absorbing that, that energy. So it doesn't heat up. Um, and so the surface of the planet is like that as well. Um, so when you take these areas that are forest and you have the trees that stick up above the snow and the trees are relatively dark, they're absorbing a lot of radiation. So that heats up the, the surface of the planet. And if you take that, those trees and you replace those with grasses that get covered up by the snow, then you have a really bright snow covered surface uh, that reflects sunlight reflects radiation away from the planet and the surface doesn't heat up. Um, so that's an actual, a really important kind of determinant of, of climate. And so when you think about taking all that forested area and replacing it uh, with a grassland, you're going from a really dark area to a really bright area. And so that, that's a cooling mechanism. Okay, and the, the theory that the ZMOFs are working with are more maybe it's an empirical observation that the animals reduce the forestry, right? Mm -hmm. By knocking over trees as they are saplings and eating on the bark or whatever, mm -hmm. so that there would be less trees growing. And that with, with um, grow, grow, global warming, we're seeing an increase of forest Forests. These shrubs are encroaching northward right now, mm -hmm. especially I think willow and maybe betula and other things too. Yeah. So you're actually, yeah, like you're saying, it's not just trees though, it's kind of smaller mm -hmm. plants and shrubs that stick up above the snow. Mm -hmm. And maybe later on we can get into 
you know, how much animals will actually impact that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the albedo effect is that you bring in the animals and it reduces, no, it increases the albedo effect by mm -hmm. reducing the dark vegetation that, ref that absorbs the heat. And yep. Correct. Soil. Um, okay. It's been stored in the soil in the Arctic. Like, how did that carbon get there? It's not just like it was there forever. By the it, way, I've seen uh, charts showing the concentration or the depth of the of of carbon in various parts of the world and the 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 chart for siberia is just stupendous i mean it is so much more than practically all the rest of the world put together the 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 amount of carbon in the soil in in that part of the world which amazed me was it Zimov who discovered that, or had that been known all along, that Siberia has so much carbon in the soil? I think he published critical papers that really brought it to light. So he's mm -hmm. not the very first person to ever think about it or discuss it, but he took a lot of the important initial measurements that was published in top-level publication, you know, like science, that really brought that to people's attention. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you follow Zimov's theory during the Ice Age, you had this high productive grassland ecosystem with lots of large herbivores, cycling nutrients, fertilizing grass, causing grass to grow very quickly. And when a plant grows, it's literally pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. That's like what photosynthesis is and making it either into sugars or cellulose or lignin or like, you know, the, the parts of the plant. Um, and so during the Ice Age, plants there that were being frequently grazed by animals were growing their roots down and these roots got frozen into the soil and it built up soil carbon. Similar to what people are discussing with regenerative agriculture in other parts of the world right now. The difference being the soils are so cold there. Um, and during the ice age there is the additional factor of dust accumulation. So you got a millimeter of dust accumulating on the surface of the soil every year which meant at the bottom of the active layer that would freeze. You, know, you get a millimeter extra froze. Um, and so one of the things they're proposing is by reintroducing these animals, this landscape, well, plants will start growing faster, particularly grasses grow very quickly anyway, especially when they're being actively grazed, and that this will become an active carbon sink. And well, we can get into this later, but Nikita actually just did some measurements in the park one year ago, or maybe two years ago, where he you know, took soil cores and measured the carbon concentrations in the areas that are most actively grazed for the past 15 years and compared that with areas outside the park that have no grazing and he found he was surprised by how much carbon sequestration had happened in his actively grazed areas and it you know that's something that needs follow-up research but it was kind of really fairly exciting initial results oh that's uh, not just exciting it sounds like world shaking you know mm -hmm. you can prove that that doing that, I mean, it sounds like that it's on the way to ev strong evidence, right? Yeah. Yeah. They need like the resources now to follow up with that and do that, you know, on a bigger scale. It's a lot, it's really labor intensive to take those samples and maybe yeah. they need like more areas with more animals so they can like track it over time rather than starting at year 15, maybe start at year zero and then follow that for the next 20 years and see mm -hmm. how that changes mm -hmm. on a, you know, like, fence off a square hectare or 10 hectares or a square kilometer and push animals in there and like follow it with time. I, Mike would probably know better how to design. Yeah, Mike, I was wondering if you'd been involved in, in that measuring process. Um, not, not for the soils. Um, most, I, I'm focused mostly on plants and, you know, kind of some of the, the land atmosphere interactions. So I've, I've done a fair bit of albedo work as well. Uh, I think the, the idea itself is, um, is is pretty intuitive uh, to ecosystem science um, in scientists in general. Um, that that is that you know kind of if you think about you know plants take carbon out of the atmosphere and then they either you know they they store it or they build tissue with it or something like that and they can either do that above ground or below ground and yeah you know, we know from places like you know kind of like the the midwest you know kind of the prairies of north america right that if you have grasses a lot of that carbon goes below ground and gets stored so they the plants like that are putting a lot more kind of into the ground and so the the real question is you know kind of like how much how much more relative to what's already in you know kind of permafrost and then 
you know, how quickly will that happen? And, you know, how, how feasible is it to make it happen on a, on a scale that, that makes a difference to the global atmosphere? So we've got two different yeah. dynamics going on here. One is the, which Luke mentioned first, is the mm -hmm. earlier that, that the cold, you want to keep it cold so that the permafrost stays frozen, mm -hmm. doesn't emit, doesn't get the microbes to create methane, which gets it back into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. That is the thing that, that has been keeping me up at night. The mm -hmm. fear that, you know, if this stuff, this stupendous amount of carbon in, in Siberia or uh, any place in the north melts and this gets into the atmosphere, it's really game over. I, I mean, there's so much there uh, that th I, I think that that is as big a challenge as the rest of the effort that we are already much more familiar with, which is reducing the emissions that we're making from our cars or whatever we're industries and so on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the business of keeping it cold is one thing, but now what you're talking about, I think is in addition, the notion that even, even currently mm -hmm. you can use various kinds of plants to sequester carbon, more mm -hmm. carbon, putting it more in every year. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, trees do that. Mm -hmm. uh, shrubs do that, but you don't want trees, trees and shrubs. You want grass. Mm -hmm. now, I've heard that their grass, some of the grass can have very long roots and really uh, sequester more carbon than you would imagine. Uh, but normally, wouldn't you think that trees would sequester more carbon than grass? And uh, what's the what's the trade-off there? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. So I guess you know the the one thing to remember is that in in these high latitudes, um, if you're if you accumulate carbon above ground, then you're you are reducing the albedo. So so on the one hand, you're you're taking carbon out of the atmosphere, but on the other hand, you're you know putting more more vegetation on the surface, and so ostensibly that's going to be a darker land surface that that heats up more. Are so, they treating this as a ratio kind of thing where you have to you have a trade off, or do you, does anybody actually try to figure out an equation of how how you could calculate whether you're winning more or losing more by various kinds of vegetation? Yeah, yeah, that's it's um, that that's something that that people do. It's um, yeah, it's it's not extremely. You know, it's not extremely simple just because, you know, kind of to, to do that math and to think about it kind of from a global perspective, you need to think about, okay, I'm like, like you know, you need to decide what, what, you know, kind of like what proportion of the surface of the earth do, do we want to think about? Do you want to think about, you know, kind of a few square kilometers or something larger? And then you need to make some assumptions about how much carbon is coming out of the atmosphere. And then... Um, you need to know something about, you know, kind of like the average climate of that place in terms of radiation, right? So you need to make some assumptions about kind of how cloudy the atmosphere, all of these, not like a kind of a simple ratio or something like that. It's, it's more kind of complex and it involves atmospheric models. Um, one is that according to Nikita's research, which is preliminary, and maybe I'm interpreting it wrong, he presented mm -hmm. this at AGU, not this last year, but the year before the amount of carbon he found in the soil in the grazed areas was greater than the above, I think above and below ground carbon in the boreal forest. So large, you know, so it's large trees are the main tree species there and mm -hmm. there is at the very northern edge of their range. They're pretty small. So you've got like large trees, you've got a layer of like litter, which is like larch leaves and moss growing and then soil. And so he's, com I think he was comparing all of that carbon, both the trees, the mm -hmm. shrubs, the moss, the litter, and the carbon in the soil in the forest with the carbon in the grass and the grass roots, you know, the soil mm -hmm. in the grazed areas and found it was substantially more. So that's, I might be getting that wrong though. So this should be, I guess, double check with Nikita. I don't know if you know the answer to this, Mike. Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't know uh, the talk, but, um, but it, it it wouldn't necessarily surprise me. I mean, we've, uh, I guess I'm just trying to recall some numbers in my, in my head and, um, you know, there's, 
w one paper that you know I was involved in with a, a handful of other collaborators. We quantified above and below ground carbon, and I think there's something on the order of 10 times more carbon in the top meter of soil than there is above ground. So if you take all the trees and shrubs and all the live stuff on the surface, um, there's 10 times more carbon in the top meter of soil in those boreal forest areas. Um, and so it's like the, you know, kind of you think, as, you know, as Luke said, we're, you know, kind of a few hundred miles above the Arctic Circle. Um, it's a pretty short growing season with harsh climatic conditions. So these forests are not, you know, kind of like big, um, you know, kind of big tall trees that are spaced close together like we might be used to kind of here in the temperate latitudes. And so it's not actually that much carbon. Mm. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't take, it, you know, if, you, if you switch from, from some of those forests and shrublands to a grassland that, you know, kind of the, the increase in below ground carbon was enough to offset what you lost above ground. It seems, seems feasible. It's not outside of the realm of possibilities. I have also heard there's a difference between species of trees. Mm. Um, there's a guy named Ian Hartley who's done work with birch trees in, in northern climates, and he says they're really bad, mm -hmm. and that black spruce trees are, are good, they are better anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and he's done things like measure the amount of uh, the temperature of the soil in a birch forest as compared with someplace nearby, but, you know, not forested. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so he thinks that the uh, birch trees make the soil warmer. Mm -hmm. One thing I think that's important is stepping back from this debate about albedo versus carbon, soil carbon storage and other things, is that the cor current boreal forest, and I think the Zimov's thinking has changed on this just in the time I've known them, probably animals by themselves aren't going to displace and replace the boreal forest. Mm -mm. What you're going to get instead is maybe there's a wildfire, which releases all the carbon from those trees anyway, and then animals occupy that area. Or a permafrost starts to thaw in an area, which disturbs the ecosystem, and then animals occupy it and colonize it and hopefully stabilize it. But so it's kind of like you're looking at these scenarios where the current ecosystem gets destroyed by climate change and then you start mitigating that with animals, not where you go out and intentionally destroy the current boreal forest mm -hmm. ecosystem. Or if you are altering it, it probably would be a more iterative process of animals kind of expanding edge areas and stuff from what we've seen, from what I've observed personally in the park, like they're not just going into the forest and wholesale converting it to grassland. And I think that initially was a big disappointment to Sergei and Nikita. But I think areas that they're going to impact first are going to be floodplain or meadows or like you know, dry lake beds, places that are already have some grass in them. Because imagine you're mm -hmm. a hungry bison or a hungry horse, like there's nothing to eat in the forest. There's no reason to go there. Mm -hmm. You're going to go to the place where the most food is and that's the spot that you're going to have the biggest impact on. But after a wildfire, after some ca catastrophic permafrost thaw, then that forest might be interesting to you because the trees are all tipped over and grass is sprouting up between them. Like at the edge of a thermal karst lake where the forest is starting to fall into the lake, there's a lot of grass growing there. Mm -hmm. If I were a bison, I would hang out there on that lake. You need to explain yeah. what that is. I'm, I was quite surprised to hear about, you call them karst or karst, that. These, uh, where there's, a, there's been a subsidence of the soil because the soil is, Melted? Is that it? The frozen? Yeah, so the soil is a network of like actual soil, like dirt, and then ice wedges. And their ice wedges make these like hexagonal patterns. And the farther north you go, the closer the ice wedges get together and the more volume they have. Um, so they can, like, I think really far north, they can be more than half of the soil volume is actually just pure wedges of ice around columns of soil. You can see it from above if you look at like, sometimes you can see it on Google Earth and you can certainly see it from like aerial photos or drone photos. Like there's just this network of polygons across the landscape. And those are the tops of the ice wedges. And so 
I think both Katie Walter has talked about this and Sergei Zimov has been talking about it for a long time, that you can get catastrophic ice wedge melt where, you know, they start melting from the top and then just keep going. And it's, it's just ice that turns to water and flows away. And so if it's on flat ground, that soil, you lose 50% of the volume of the soil and it just collapses. Maybe it falls like 20 meters or something. And it makes a lake there, a puddle, and that's called a thermokarst lake. Mm -hmm. How big an area would such a thing be? <clears throat> I think it can be a whole range of sizes from like small, but they tend to migrate across the landscape. Like one edge of it will start eroding and the ground, like the ice wedges on that side of the lake will start melting and the soil will start falling into the lake and the lake will literally crawl across the landscape and it'll leave a valley behind it oh. where it melted through all the ice wedges as it crawled along. So you have these big like pits. For, it's for like a snail with a snail trail behind it <laughs> because they're they're leaving this path as they move across the landscape and you can see the paths maybe they, sometimes there's more than one lake you know kind of in little pockets in the path and stuff mm -hmm. um, and you can see if you look at if you look at google earth of this area you can really clearly see the thermokarst lakes uh-huh okay it, it, mike you you have some work involving forest fires is that right you you're tracing tell tell us about your work and how that relates to why do you go to Pleistocene Park to look at trees for your research? Yeah. Um, well, so I guess one uh, one of the reasons we go to Siberia at, at all um, is just because it's um, it's quite a different part of the Arctic, and it's you know there's there's not a lot of uh, not a lot of information in the English language scientific literature. Um, uh, you know, on the ecosystem dynamics, on the fire regime, anything like this. Um, so there's about a, maybe three or four million square kilometers in northeastern Siberia that is underlain by continuous permafrost. So that's, you know, 90% of the landscape or more has permafrost underneath it. And these areas are dominated by larch forests, so like a tamarack. So it's a deciduous conifer. A tamarack um, is a larch. Yep. Yeah. So, so yeah. So that's what the um, you know kind of uh, larch or larix is the genus, and in North America they're sometimes called tamarack. But it's yeah. So it's like a, a conifer, like a pine tree that that just drops its needles every fall. Um, so that's the only species of tree in this large area. There's you know there there are a few a few kind of uh, random spots in the landscape, um, you know, kind of along riverbeds and stuff where there may be um, some birch, um, but there, that's really, really rare. And so it's, it's primarily um, larch in these areas. And so the, the characteristics of uh, wildfire are different there. Um, it's the trees, you know, kind of like in North America, we have a lot of uh, black spruce forests, which those uh, those forests are, um, you know, kind of they're fire dependent for regeneration, right? So black spruce have serotonous cones that you have what <laughs> they have they have what's what's called a serotonous cone, which means that you know their their cones they hang out on the tree. The cones are kind of closed, encased in resin, and so the only way that those cones can open and disperse the seeds is if they're heated up in a fire. So, so, so black spruce, for example, need fire um, to disperse. And so, you know, so, so that's a, a fire adapted system. That's one way that that, you know, kind of system responds to fire. Whereas in, you know, large forests are not, they don't have cones like that. And so that the way, the way that those forests regenerate after fire, the ecology of those forests is fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. um, so you know that's that's just kind of one reason that we that we go to Siberia, and then going to um, going to Chersky, um, we do that you know in part because the Zimovs are there. In addition to having you know Pleistocene Park, they also run a research station. Um, so they they host international researchers. They have lab space. They have you know um, a bit of of instrumentation and equipment. And so really, you know, it's, it's one of the probably handful of Arctic research stations um, in the world where you can, 
you can go to to answer these kind of questions. And, and so, so in some ways, it's it's pragmatic reasons that we go there. Okay. Well, uh, it, you know, tell me about forest fires in the Arctic because it's, uh, they're certainly happening more, as I understand. Mm -hmm. it. And they will if there's more forest, and if there's, uh, you know, with climate change, there will be more forest fires. Mm -hmm. right? And this itself is a s tremendous source of carbon into the atmosphere, right? Yeah. So I would have thought that forest fires are an unmitigated evil. Uh, but what both of you have said sort of indicates that maybe there, there's a good side to it, too. Is that something we should think about? Yeah, I don't yeah. yeah. Well, go ahead. Go ahead, Lou. Oh, I was going to say, I, I wouldn't say that forest fires themselves are uh, good. It's just because they are releasing carbon into the atmosphere and disturbing the soil underneath there, which can then start thawing. Mm -hmm. um, so my personal impression is that you don't want to just disturb forests, but forests are going to get disturbed anyway, both by permafrost thaw and by fire. And that if they are disturbed, that might be a good time to introduce animals. Mm -hmm. But if you have like an intact functional forest and permafrost isn't thawing, my impression is you might want to just leave that alone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's an open question right now. Um, and it, I, I, I think your your impression, Luke, is pr is probably correct. You know, in the in the past, you know, like if 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 you're in you know kind of the the vicinity of Pleistocene Park, um, you know, you're not going to find any trees that are older than 250 or 300 years. Um, and effectively, what that means is that you know that that forest burned about 300 years ago and then, you know, kind of a new forest regenerated after that. So most, most Northern eco ecosystems, either in, you know, kind of Eurasia or boreal North America, they're, they're fire adapted systems. Fire is a part of the ecosystem. And so, um, so you can pretty much assume that anywhere you go on the landscape, you know, what, what you're seeing is an ecosystem that has, you know, kind of uh, regrown after, after fire. And so, you know, in a place like Siberia, the fact that we can walk around and see those uh, forests on the landscape and know that, you know, hey, this burned 200 years ago or 100 years ago or 40 years ago and we're, and we're seeing some regrowth afterwards shows you that, you know, yes, the, the fire may, it's going to put some carbon into the atmosphere. It, it may, um, you know, kind of temporarily warm the soil up and maybe thaw out some of the top layer of permafrost. But as the ecosystem recovers, um, as you know, kind of you burn off a lot of the soil, you uh, kill the trees, and then as you know, vegetation starts to regrow and soil starts to reaccumulate, um, some of that permafrost refreezes or it recovers a little bit. Um, but I think you know whether or not that's that's still going to happen in the future is is an open question. Um, and so that's, you know, kind of, that, that's a hard question to answer, especially in Siberia, because um, there, there isn't, there are not detailed fire records like we have in North America. Like there's a, a good record going back to the, the late 1940s in Alaska and a similar record in, in Canada where we have maps of fires that go all the way back now, almost 80 years. And so we can kind of like, you know, look at, look at some sites that have burned 80 years ago, 60 years ago, 40 years ago, see what recovery is like. Um, we can't even do that in, in Siberia because there aren't, you know, the, there aren't good records um, that are easily accessible in a central location. Um, so it's, it's really kind of an open. Well, open what question. about measurements going on now? Mm -hmm. In other words, how, look at, Give me evidence one way or another as to whether the Zimov experiment is, is whether they're right, whether introducing animals does keep the, the soil colder and reduce permafrost melt, um, whether, it, whether to, you know, you prefer to have grassland rather than trees or if um, 
if you have to qualify it, does it make any difference what kind of trees you have? Is that a, an if kind of uh, measure? Uh, what it, I, I have the impression that they haven't done anything like the amount of measurement that uh, other scientists would like for them to, to collect in order to prove their point. Um, do you know whether they're actually measuring things adequately now and whether the, the, the numbers they've been collecting so far would sustain their argument? Um, I, I would say that they, they probably don't have um, adequate measurements just in terms of the number of measurements kind of like the in terms of you know repeated measurements so all around the park um, and then also over time right so they so they have you know they have a few baseline measurements but it's really it's it's not kind of a large enough sample size to kind of necessarily prove their point but i don't think that they need to because all of the things so yeah, so I, I think this maybe gets at the heart of the, the question of Pleistocene Park, right? Because all of the arguments that, that the Z-mobs are making and that Luke outlined about, um, you know, kind of like uh, differences in the density of snow and how that affects ground temperature, um, differences in carbon, differences in albedo, you can, you can measure those in other places without having them, you know, like it doesn't have, have to have been like the situation doesn't have to have been created by animals in order to kind of test those ideas. And we, you know, those, those, a, a lot of the, you know, kind of a lot of those ideas are really fundamental to, you know, kind of how we understand, you know, kind of uh, ecosystem science. Okay. So to what extent are their arguments being accepted by scientists elsewhere? Just to follow up on what Mike was saying, the relationship between snow depth and uh, thermal conductivity to the ground, I think is, is, is I think it's pretty simple thermodynamics, and it's well yeah. understood and experimentally verified, mm -hmm. and it's being used to conduct a lot of other experiments in other parts of the Arctic. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt if you remove snow, the ground will get and stay colder. I think the big question is, can animals achieve that effect? Like if you go out there with a shovel, you can totally achieve that effect and measure mm -hmm. the impact. Will animals achieve that effect? And will animals achieve that effect over a really large territory, like you know, an area mm -hmm. from California to New York and back is kind of the, mm -hmm. the areas we're looking at doing this on. And that's, I think, the more open question. Yeah. And, and whether you could get enough animals to do the job. Mm -hmm. I mean, exactly. How would you uh, get such enormous herds of, of huge animals in any uh, foreseeable period of time? And do you want to do that before you're certain that it's going to work? Mm -hmm. Like, on what, maybe you do need an experiment on an appropriate scale to see this is working before you commit to this like yeah. large scale plan. That could, you know, what if it backfires? What if it doesn't work out the way you're planning? What if it makes the problem worse? You kind of want to. Well, the first thing work as advertised before you launch on a continental scale. Right. The first thing that I think an ordinary person would raise as a potential objection to doing it at all is the fact that the animals themselves produce methane you know they burp and they fart and they leave droppings that make mm -hmm. methane so the question there is do they um offset the amount of methane that they produce by by their activities of stomping the snow and eating the grass and and knocking over trees or whatever um, and, and I don't know whether anybody's even tried to answer that. I talked with Nikita a little bit about this. Um, and I think this is another case where someone who better understands the mechanism should follow up with the math. But I think like a cow or say a bison emits, I want to say like 100 kilograms of methane a year. Uh, horses apparently emit a lot less because they have a different kind of digestive system. So it's mainly, mainly like cows and bison. Mm -hmm. Sheep also do it. Um, and my understanding is that ignoring the snow trampling and the albedo effect, the amount of carbon that hopefully will be stored in the soil by these animals dwarfs the amount of methane they'll be emitting, even with methane being a stronger climate forcer. 
by the way, I just saw something uh, not long ago about the, the some fellow was claiming that the amount of methane, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to be in over my head and I won't get this right, but uh, it's offset by the methanotropic bacteria that are in the soil. There are certain types of bacteria that eat methane. They, they're among the few things in the world that can break apart the methane molecule. And, and so these bacteria exist in the soil and uh, offset uh, some of the effects. Now, and another thing I read, um, and maybe Mike can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I read that the ice cores that have been taken from, you know, showing ancient times or um, Pleistocene period when there were so many more animals, big animals in the Arctic than there are today, they should, you would figure that, that with the amount of methane they emitted um, from both ends, if you will, um, they, there should be a lot more methane in the air and therefore it should show up in the ice core. But the ice cores from that period are not higher. And, uh, and the explanation given or theory given was that it had to do with the methanotropic bacteria. Um, I think he published a paper looking at Greenland ice cores that other people analyzed. Who did? And he published? found evidence that there were large numbers of herbivores emitting methane into the atmosphere based on those ice cores. It was part of what they used to support their theory that there was a really high density of large herbivores in the Arctic during the Ice Age. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Nikita's work, you say? Or somebody this else? Sergei's work. I think Who? he was the co author. Who? Sergei and Nikita. Nikita was a co-author. I think it was Sergei was the first author on this paper. So they claimed that there was a lot of methane in the air at the time. That there was a signal, there was an atmospheric methane signal that corresponded with this number of herbivores. Okay, so that would contradict this, the, the argument that the methane emissions during that period were not remarkably higher than now, if at all and that it would have been uh, attributable to the methanotropic bacteria. Now, I don't know if it actually contradicts. I think they were looking at isotopes and I don't actually understand isotopes that well. Yeah, but I've got, really I've got nothing to help here. <laughs> you, know, I, you don't know. Yeah, no, I, I, I would admit, yeah, I would imagine that there's probably, you know, there's there's probably some good interpretation of, you know, kind of historic uh, patterns in atmospheric methane concentrations, but I, I don't know what that is um, and how it relates to the density of, uh, of herbivores on the planet. Um, but I imagine too, like, uh, you know, I think that, that, also, that also has to do with a, a lot with um, the distribution of wetlands uh, on the planet and, you know, kind of patterns in climate in general. And so I imagine that, um, you know, kind of as, as Luke suggests that you'd probably need to use uh, some, some aspect of the isotopic signature of methane to, uh, you know, make some assumptions about what the sources of methane are. Maybe, I, I, I don't know. So, it, so those, those two ideas, uh, Need not necessarily be contradictory, but I'm I'm not not familiar enough, uh, or really at all, with uh, with uh, atmospheric methane dynamics at those time scales. To well, who's to who's going? I mean, I haven't heard much about these these bacteria, and mm -hmm. it, I, the little bit that I've I've read indicates that the people find it quite difficult to manage them in in laboratories. They, 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 you have to provide the methane for them and it gets a little tricky. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't know whether people, I've heard people say, well, that, that's, you know, the amount of methane bacteria in the soil is just so minute compared to the amount of real methane that it, it really, and other sources of methane that it wouldn't, you couldn't explain anything by such a tiny little thing. Mm -hmm. and I, I just don't know. I wish I could find out more. I don't see a lot of... I think it also matters, is, is that effect changing with time? Because if you have always had methane emissions, you've always had bacteria processing methane, 
and you add more methane emissions, but you don't have more bacteria processing methane, you have a net gain. Mm -hmm. So to me, maybe Mike can fill this in, but to me, it seems like those bacteria would only be relevant if their numbers were increasing in the world, either due to climate change or more methane or decreasing. Like if there is a, a trend over time with those bacteria, if they're a constant effect, then they're not really going to change the new emissions of methane, if that makes sense. You know, if there's if there like, a, if they're a constant, if they're processing a constant amount of methane over time, that doesn't change anything. Like if they always have been and always will be, that's just like a steady factor. Too many unknowns, I think, for us to, what? <laughs> too many unknowns for us to draw any conclusions here, I think. Yeah. Uh -huh. Tell me about the environmental impact of introducing uh, animals, big animals, uh, large numbers of additional animals. Because I, I talked to one uh, journalist who covers the Arctic, uh, who was very opposed to the idea. He said that the native people would not like it at all. They had their caribou herds and they, they don't want anybody messing around with their environment. And um, and that they, if you brought in large numbers of things like bison and foreign breeds of animals, that they would bring in new diseases, and uh, you know that they wouldn't probably live there very well. Tell me about the practicality of what you think is involved in importing or trying to increase the size of bison herds or other big animals. It, is it a practical thing? Um, certainly is an ambitious idea, uh, almost a kind of fantasy of what might, uh, what the Arctic might look like under very different conditions. But would they, would they be harmful? Can you foresee the different uh, problems that might come if, if uh, people even tried to bring in large numbers of animals? In the short term, there's potential for conflict. In the area specifically around Chersky, there is a pretty small number of reindeer herders. I think I may have met all of them. Um, so it's, it's not a really big population and it's kind of a declining lifestyle now as people move to the cities and take on other lifestyles. And that would be- really Sorry, are these an indigenous people who've always done this or what? They're Chukchis. Uh, and I understand, this is according to Sergei Zimov, and I would take this with a grain of salt, but he says they adopted reindeer herding fairly recently, oh. like within the past hundred years. And before that, they were actual, more had a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. So it's a rather recent development in their, like a change in their lifestyle that they adopted from other local indigenous people. Mm -hmm. um, well, do they see the, the Zimov's uh, uh, experiment as a threat to their own livelihood? Uh, I honestly, Nikita buys reindeer from them sometimes. Mm -hmm. I don't think they think about it very much. I think it's just, oh, the Zimovs are doing this wacky thing. Like, I don't think they, it's such a small, it's such a big landscape. And right now, Pleistocene Park is such a small thing. I think it's more just like a, an object of curiosity. Like, oh, what are the Z-mobs doing now? That's kind of cool. What animal did they get now? Uh, but that may change in the future if the Z-mobs are kind of talking about taking over the landscape on a massive scale. The, there's also, I think, a Venk in Dogon. There's several indigenous groups there. And so there's some that are reindeer herders. They are like very small numbers of them. There's people who traditionally are fishermen and hunter-gatherers and you know, don't do pastoralism. They don't have domestic animals. Um, and then a little farther to the west are uh, Yakutians. And Yakutians are, they originally came from like the Lake Baikal region and migrated to the north, bringing horses and cattle with them. And then they started occupying the Arctic. I think this was around like 800 years ago or something. They were kind of displaced by the expansion of the Mongolians. So they have a similar agro, not agroecology, but like pastoral ecology system to Mongolians. And they transpose that to the Arctic. And so they have horses and cows primarily. And about 500 kilometers to the west of Pleistocene Park, there is a settlement of Yakutians 
who have can, villages and horses I can, and I can uh, subsist with herds of horses and cattle because I'm I'm surprised that there are any cows that can live in such a cattle. It's a specific breed of cattle that's adapted to the Arctic. Um, and the horses that the Zimovs have in the park, they bought those from Yakutians. So they're like, they're ponies, they're small. In the fall, they gain like, I want to say like over 100 kilos of pure fat. Like they just turn into these like fluffy butterballs. And that's what they need to get through the winter. They're really cute in the fall because they get like incredibly fat. And they just like kind of waddle around the landscape and their fur gets really long. So they're just like these, these fluffy ball, horse balls. And they're white or kind of white and gray. Uh -huh. um, so as the concept of Pleistocene Park expanded, it would also meet with the Yakutians who occupy that area. And that would be kind of a complicated social and political issue to address. I don't like, I think it would be challenging, especially I think the Yakutians have more political power because this area is an indigenous republic, you know, Saha Republic or Yakutia as it's known. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, this indigenous group is the dominant group in the area and the, they have more than half the population. So mm -hmm. expanding in a way that accommodated their concerns and their feelings would be quite important. Uh, and I don't know how you would go about that. And they, you think they wouldn't particularly appreciate it? I don't know what they would think. I, it might depend on how you approach them about it and how if they felt ownership of the project or if they felt it was imposed upon them. But this is all kind of social and political theory mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in Russia in an area that like I don't know that much about the social dynamics of. But I've, I've definitely worked with native people in Alaska and you know the more respect you show people and the more you engage them in what you're doing the more likely you are to have them in turn work with you rather than oppose you. That's well, uh, it, 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 let's think about the fact that, uh, not the fact, but the possibility, and I imagine the, re the likelihood that these animals would need human care because uh, I, th I think somebody told me that the things they've imported so far, some of them couldn't live on their own, that people go out and feed them in the winter and as you say, some of them have to have a hole knocked in the ice so they can drink. Uh, if they couldn't live on their own, as, as the theory suggests that they, they could, I mean, the whole notion is that you could have animals living as they did during the Pleistocene era um, without human, human help. Uh, but suppose you really needed to have somebody look after some of these animals then some of these Yakuts might find it very uh, a nice job. I'm, I'm, I'm only... I don't think the concept works on a large scale if the animals can't live and expand their numbers on their own. Um, and it seems that bison probably will be able to do that. They've done that in Alaska. Uh, horses are a bit more questionable, even Yakutian horses, whether they can do that completely untended. It partially depends on their interaction with bison. Um, but in the short term, certainly, you know, getting animal population started, you're going to have a faster growth rate and more success if you take care of them for, you know, while they adapt and like start having babies and stuff. Are they, Zimov's predicting that they won't always have to have help, that they don't need to have shelters put up for them or uh, food brought? They're predicting that these animals will be able to, in the long term, survive on their own and expand on their own. Mm -hmm. Some animals, like the cattle, obviously won't be able to do that. And so those cattle are there, the, the Kolmikian cows, simply because they were cheap and easy to get, and they work as a proxy for bison or other herbivores that can survive there. So those, those aren't seen as a long-term solution. Those are seen as a short-term solution because they couldn't get bison, and they wanted to test their theories. And they, so they got cattle just to see, like, if I can't get bison, I'll get cows. Maybe that will at least show me, you know, how the cows are affecting permafrost temperature, how they're affecting nutrient cycling, if they're encouraging grass to grow. You know, they're like, I want to test this this year. 
and not like 10 years from now when I finally figure out how to get bison. It's going to be too well, late. There are other animals. I mean, what about musk oxen and yaks and I don't know. They have yaks. Um, they have musk ox. It's difficult to get different kind of animals. So, you know, they, they've been very pragmatic about like, if we can get cows this year, let's get cows. They're really cheap. It's not that they like are available not that far away. Um, we can just go ahead and do this and well, start what about just that. increasing the herds of uh, caribou or reindeer? Uh, could is there any prospect that uh, you know creating a whole lot more herds would uh, solve would approximate the thing they're trying to do with the bison they couldn't get? I think reindeer on their own aren't going to have the effect, but they could play a role. Like, you know, they could be a puzzle piece, but they're not going to do it by themselves. They're too small and too delicate. Um, they've been bringing reindeer to the park, buying them from local reindeer herders. The local reindeer, domestic reindeer herds have shrunk in recent time because the herders are drifting away from that lifestyle, especially since the collapse of the Soviet Union. They don't have much support. It's a difficult life. So well, reversing that would take a special intervention, right? Like how do you get reindeer herders to increase their herds? Well, yes, but does it depend on the herders to increase the herds? I mean, you would think that if in a state of nature, if nobody was looking after these animals, they would just multiply until well, this is another support them. So there's both there's domestic reindeer and there's wild reindeer equivalent to caribou. Oh. Um, and the domestic reindeer herders, if they see a wild reindeer, they shoot it because the males come and steal their females. Huh. So domestic <laughs> reindeer herders, this is according to Sergei Zimov, like, you know, you might want to talk with an anthropologist or a actual reindeer herder who might explain it differently because Sergei is, you know, he has his opinions about things. But the domestic reindeer herders, they consider a wild reindeer worse than a wolf because it will steal away females. Thing. Okay, I didn't, I, I was told recently that there's not really any difference between reindeer and caribou. They're basically the same thing. There isn't, but if I have a hundred reindeer that are mine, and <laughs> another reindeer that just lives in the mountains comes and steals them. And the ladies all prefer the wild reindeer and run away to mate with him. Is that? <laughs> <they're> I, <laughs> uh, but there's, you know, there's a conflict between domestic reindeer herding and it's wild reindeer. It's like a stereotype of the macho Tarzan guy that every woman craves. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've, I've drawn the conversation a little bit aside. I want to ask something about uh, Pete, if I can, before this conversation comes to an end. Mike, tell me about peat fires, because... Uh, I, you know, a few years ago in Russia, there were, were huge underground fires of peat. I don't quite understand how things can burn when there's no oxygen or that, I don't understand how it's possible for peat underground to, to burn, but I understand that it's impossible to put the fire out. Tell me about it. Is that a part of what you study or is it a risk? And if it's a risk, is it increasing? Um. So yes, it's part of what we look at. Um, most, most areas on the landscape in this part of the world, whether you're thinking about North America or Eurasia, whether it's boreal forest or whether you're further north in Arctic tundra, the soils are, you know, to some extent peaty. Maybe the top 10, 20 centimeters are very organic rich, um, what we would consider peaty soils. And so that's typically what's burning whenever there is a wildfire. Um, and there are, you know, there are fires that occur in Arctic tundra as well. So you don't have to have forests to have fires. Um, and this stuff, you know, it, it dries out and it makes a pretty good fuel. And so that's, um, that's what ends up burning. I think, you know, kind of when we, when we think about these, places where you have peat that smolders for months on end and can sm smolder over winter. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, they are low oxygen environments, but they're not, you know, completely devoid of oxygen. So there won't be, you know, kind of like open flames or anything, but there's still, there's still enough heat that, you know, kind of you can, 
you can have things that smolder for months at a time. Um, I think there have been um, instances of fires. What I'm thinking of has happened in, in Northern Canada, but smoldered over winter or fires that, you know, start in the middle of summer somewhere in the Arctic and, and kind of are burning, you know, kind of openly for a while. And then, you know, maybe you get some colder weather and some snowfalls and it, kind of smolders for a bit and then things dry out and warm up and then the fire flares back up. Mm -hmm. So, so it's certainly, you know, it's certainly something that's going on. It's well now, isn't, wouldn't that be a major uh, contribution to the carbon in the, in the atmosphere? Because mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, uh, you haven't said what the soil is like that's permafrost, but is the permafrost, some of it peat? And and if it burns, isn't there a lot of carbon that that gets emitted thereby? Yeah. So typically, well, that's I don't know. It's it's hard to kind of generalize generalize permafrost soils, but at least in you know kind of in northeastern Siberia and the areas that we're talking about that are underlain by permafrost, there's usually maybe anywhere from ten to thirty centimeters of kind of organic rich peaty soils and then beneath that it's kind of silty clay soils um, that you know that there's actually not a you know in terms of the absolute percentage not a high amount of organic matter um, but because there's so much of those soils and because the organic matter is frozen if you add it all up it's a lot um, so certainly when when that top peaty layer when that burns there are combustion emissions that's another thing that's really hard to get a handle on because they're, you know. How would you fight it? What, what do they do to try to put such a fire out? Um, I don't think they do anything in Siberia. Like there's too big of a landscape. You just wait for it to go out. Yeah, pretty much anywhere, I think, in the Arctic or subarctic. If it's, if it's nearby to a settlement or human infrastructure, then you know kind of they would try to put it out i think so there's one fire that we worked at that that burned around the year 2001 that's just outside of chersky and um you know somebody basically drove a bulldozer out to kind of where that fire was heading toward town and then just bulldozed a fire break across you know, across the landscape dig a trench or something like that. Would yeah. Just took a bulldozer and just basically scraped off that top layer of soil. You know, so it, it thaws out maybe 50 centimeters or hundred centimeters. And if you just bulldoze that, huh. um, you know, that uh, let's say top 10 or 20 centimeters off, then that's, that's enough to, to act as a fire break. And that did. Okay. Oh. But, so, so it's, you know, if you need to stop it from burning a house or something like that, you can. Mm -hmm. Um, but if it's not near human settlement, then I think it, you know, they're, they're left to burn. So that's been happening uh -huh. you know, okay. for hundreds of years. And you guys are both going to be going back to the Pleistocene Park yourselves for further study or not? <laughs> uh, not, probably not this summer. I don't. Well, nobody's going to go anywhere this summer. We're all going to be in social isolation. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know if I'll make it back this summer either. I was actually planning on going back, and my plans are all thrown into disarray. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I I was not planning on going this summer, but um, my my collaborators uh, had planned to go, and uh, somebody from my lab was going to go as well. But it's it's looking like that trip is not going to happen. Um, so we've got one, one more year on the current project. So, so we'll go next summer. And then after that, it remains to be seen, but we're, we're planning on applying for more funding. So. Well, keep me posted on whatever it is you find out in all the articles that you write. And I think we've wave, wound up our time and uh, we should call this to a halt, even though I'd love to keep going for another hour. Uh, I want to add a couple of things really quick. Uh, two papers have just come out. One was in the, what is it, the British, not the Royal Academy of Sciences. Philosophical but, Transactions of the Royal Society. Yeah. Yes, I saw that. It was very encouraging for anybody yeah. who wants to see more of this kind of experimentation. 
Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And that one was interesting because he proposes a, a scale and a budget for really testing the idea. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's easy to criticize the ZMOGs for not having enough data, but they've literally set this all up themselves. Mm -hmm. And in order to really gather data, you need a more functional ecosystem. And to do that, you need more animals. And for more animals, you need more money. And so these guys are actually proposing like a scale and a budget to do that, that they think would be reasonable to mm -hmm like really test the idea. And I think that's an important thing to see mm -hmm. um, and not like judging the ZMOGs on what they have right now and have done completely on their own. Yeah. Uh, and then the other paper, which just came out, it was published in Nature and it's really exciting, was a German scientist, Beer is his last name. I forget his first name, but the last name stuck with me. Um, Christian Beer. Christian Beer. Yeah. Uh, and he uh, looked like at- Regular Beer, B-E-E-R. Yep. Okay. Uh, and so he looked at, um, the impacts of reindeer in Norway, I think, or maybe Finland on ground temperature by trampling the snow. And he looked at some data from Pleistocene Park and then he modeled it and he came up with, you know, surprisingly optimistic results of how big of an impact animals could have in the Arctic. And, you know, it's published in nature. So it's kind of, I think a big deal. I haven't even really talked to Nikita about it yet. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of a really, I think, important and interesting step for them getting these two papers published that maybe mm -hmm. interest is growing and there is are going to be additional steps taken and additional people getting involved in this and pushing it forward so i, I found both those things just really kind of exciting and yeah i mean i'm certainly interested in it i i'd love to uh, interview uh, nikita probably uh, i don't know whether i'll ever get a chance because you know the world is in, in he knows about skype you can interview him okay yeah fine i'll ask his i'll i'll ask you to give me a reference to him or something okay yes yeah, winter time he oh. probably needs a little bit of social exposure <laughs> okay this has been fun and uh, just really very important i think the whole issue is is something that we really need to think about we can't just solve one of our existential threats we have a whole bunch of them and you can't ch choose, you've got to do them all. Yeah. So you guys are doing your part to solve the permafrost problem and bless your hearts. Thank you very much. And I uh, hope we'll be in touch again. Okay. All right. Very Thank good. You. Thanks. Bye. Bye. This conversation is one of the weekly series, Talk About Saving the World, produced by Peace Magazine and Project Save the World. Please visit our website at tosavetheworld.ca, where you can sign the Platform for Survival, a list of 25 public policy proposals that, if enacted, would greatly reduce the risk of six global threats to humankind. Come back next week for another discussion of a serious global issue.